Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday edition of the HockeyDebates.com podcast. As with every Thursday, it's this week in NHL betting. We're going to inform you on some of the, the movement in the NHL betting lines, talk about where you should be putting your money and when you should be putting your money back in your pocket. And always in the news, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they always get an overabundance of attention, certainly in Canada. And this week, they actually deserve the attention because there's been some uh, major developments in Toronto's situation. There's always been a theory if Freddie Anderson ever got hurt, the Leafs were doomed, and Freddie Anderson got hurt. And the Leafs moved, after losing one game basically without Freddie as their starter, moved to get Jack Campbell from the Los Angeles Kings. Now, what are we looking at, Kevin, with the Leafs? Are we looking at a team in desperate trouble here? Well, I don't think we know. I think that uh, we're going to have to know more about Anderson's you know, injury. Um, like, I like that trade a lot, but you know, that isn't going to replace the loss of Anderson if it was long term. Um, you know, I, I, I think they needed a quality backup goalie because, you know, the four points or six points that the backup's going to have to get could be the difference or the difference between Hutchinson and, and um, you know, the, the, the player they just uh, acquired, uh, uh, whose name suddenly just has, has escaped me. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Campbell from Port Huron, Michigan. Yeah, I know where he's from. I just couldn't go with his name. That's terrible. Um, but anyway, the uh, like I think the difference between him and Hutchinson is probably six points for the rest of the season. Well, that that may be what they need to get in the playoffs. But if they're counting on him to be a difference in a playoff series, you know, he's just unproven in that regard. So I like the trade, but I don't think it really changes their playoff um you know potential i think that is going to require a significant upgrade on defense which i believe they're going to do now not everybody does but i i think they're going to add someone that'll help them well the other guy in that deal is a uh, kyle clifford and he's won two stanley cups and is a guy that kind of plays with that you know so-called edge that really the leafs don't have a lot of guys like that do you think that is kind of a, a quiet part of this deal that maybe no one's paying attention to that could help the leafs Kevin? Well, for sure. I mean, you know, anytime you get a guy who can play with a little grit, I mean, you're adding a playoff guy. So, I mean, that, that makes them harder to play against. But again, I, I don't think it's enough yet. Um, like that's ni a nice first step, but I, I don't think that's the, um, you know, the major move that Kyle Dubas, uh, uh, Kyle Dubas is going to make. Like, I, I think, you know, he's got another one up his sleeve and I don't know what it'll be, but um, I just can't imagine this is his move. Um, you know, this is the appetizer. You know, the main course is, is yet to come. And um, I like Clifford quite a bit. And, you know, those are the, the players that um, do make a difference in a playoff series. But, um, you know, I, I just can't wait to see what he has. I mean, you know, the hot rumor has been, you know, Dumba. Um, you know, would he be the guy they're going to bring in? And, you know, what's interesting about that, and I've, I've said this before, you know, I, I think of their needs as a guy that can fit 20 minutes and play a good, solid, dependable defensive game. You know, that's really not Dumba. You know, he's a highly skilled guy. Um, and But, boy, would he look nice with those uh, uh, great group of forwards that Toronto has? And I absolutely would. So I think it's going to be interesting. If that's the move he makes, you know, that's kind of like pushing all in offensively. But but Dumba's got a physical edge as well. So, you know, that, that would help. Um, uh, as well, but you know, it, are, are they going to go in a completely different um, direction and go like a guy like Brendan Dillon, who is hard to play against? You know, be, he can be that guy, that twenty-minute guy uh, that's uh, hard to play against and a little more defensive uh, in his orientation. Trading for Dillon would be the hockey version of what the Rockets just did, getting rid of Clint Capella for Robert Covington, going completely small ball, one hundred percent. And it's not something that we've seen work in the playoffs um, here before, but also, you know, before the Warriors won a title, we didn't see their brand of basketball work in the playoffs up to that point in time either. So it would be an interesting maneuver for sure. But I, uh, I'm with Kevin. I, I love the acquisition of Campbell purely for the regular season. Right. Kevin's absolutely right. He's not going to lead them to it. Um, any sort of playoff success, if they're counting on him for that, I think you're doing it from the get-go. But at the same point in time, they are fighting through the nail just to get into the playoffs. And they're not gonna, if they want to make a deep run, um, come playoff time, you're going to need Anderson to be at least a little bit rested 
Um, and they just they basically could not afford at this point in time to be playing Hutchinson and stay in the playoff race. And they're going to have to, they actually have to make up ground now. They're sitting 10th in the conference, but they're going to get in. They need to come back up goaltender. It's just not giving it to them. Yeah, I'll tell you what I would not do. I'd love to get your guys' take on this too. You know, I see so much about, well, we'll trade Cap and then we'll get that defensive player we need. Like, I would not mess <clears throat> with that group of forwards that is really the Maple Leafs' identity. I mean, what makes the Maple Leafs dangerous what makes them exciting what makes them um you know fearful you're fearful of them during the postseason is that gr great group of of creative offensive forwards and i would basically just tell anybody that i'm trading with you know I, i'm not disrupting that group that you know i'll i'll trade anybody else on my roster to get that defensive help but i'm not uh, i'm not disrupting that and i don't think they have to i you know, I read all the angst over the the cap, the salary cap, but I, I've seen way too many times teams that are supposedly capped out that find a creative way to make the moves they need to make. And, you know, I, I've had fans uh, write to me and say, oh, they can't get both a quality backup goalie and a, a player to help on defense. And I said, that's ludicrous. Of course they can. You know, I, I don't know how they can do it. I mean, I haven't figured that out, but – you know it can happen because we've seen it happen too many times. Too many times Jim Rutherford has been up against the cap and found a way to improve his hockey team. And that's part of being a GM today is you got to have creativity. You know, it's it's never simple. It's always complicated. And you got to figure it out. That, that's part of it. That's the salary cap era. And uh, I'm sure Kyle Dubas is going, is going to figure that out. And, you know, I don't know who's going to be moved. He'll have to make that decision. But somebody will get moved. He'll create the space. But I, I just can't imagine he's going to disrupt that quality group of forwards he has or take one away from that. I, I just don't see how that benefits them to, to uh, you know, eliminate one score or just to add one defensive player. Yeah, and they, that's the only part of their team that's sort of working right now, and I'd be very hesitant to break it up. They're sitting second in the league in goal four. Right. Want, if, you, if, you, if you want to mess with something that's clearly working extremely efficiently, that's his prerogative, but I sure wouldn't do it either. No, personally, I wouldn't bet on the Leafs, but if someone's of that mind, Sasha, is now the time to bet on them? And you got to think with this uncertainty about Anderson that the line's going to move in the opposite direction for Toronto and you're probably going to be able to get a good price on them. Is it just stay away completely from them or is now the time to jump? Just looking at the latest Stanley Cup futures here. Yeah, you know, you're getting them at plus 2,500 to win the Stanley Cup. You're looking at plus 1,200 to win the East. With the public team like the Maple Leafs, it's very hard to get value in the futures market because there is so much of an appetite for betting on them. Teams with the biggest fan base or fan base as well to attract the most betting from the general public because fans of teams want to bet on their teams and want to profit when they win. Um, but this is basically the longest you've ever seen the Maple Leafs odds in the 2019 2020 season. Um, so if you are a believer in what they're going to be doing long term, um, now would be the time to buy low. But at the same point in time, remember that you're also betting on a team to make a deep playoff run that is currently sitting 10, two spots out of playoff position in a very strong Eastern Conference. Um, so I'm personally not going to be putting any of my money on Maple Leafs uh, to either win the Eastern Conference or win the Stanley Cup. But if you're someone who's really dead set on doing so, you're not going to get better at well, I mean, if you're a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs to start with, you've pretty much thrown logic out of uh, the window as part of your life experience anyway. So I would think that if you're going to bet the Leafs anyway, you might as well bet them and get a price at the same time. Very true. Yeah, part, part of the Maple Leaf fan makeup, too, is to say there's no way something is going to happen. Like, you know, when they played the Bruins again last season, you know, I remember talking to fans who said, you know, we just can't beat the – the Bruins. And I would say to them, yeah, actually you can. Like if you played that series 10 times, the Leafs might win two or three times. You just got to hope this is the, the time when they win. I mean, you know, the Bruins would not win that series 10 consecutive times. It just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, that, there's so much parity in the NHL that the difference between a team being better and uh, the team, the other team being not quite as good, you know, is the difference between, you know, winning, uh, you know, seven times out of 10 and six times out of 10. It's, you know, it's really that close. And 
you know, that's why, like, I understand the, you know, some fans are frustrated because, you know, historically, you know, these moves, you give up a lot for them, especially rentals, and then they don't work out. But when you're close and, and you, you figure, boy, if I could just get one guy that would change everything, because, uh, you know, depending on what happened, like if the Leafs get a defenseman that could play in the second pairing, well, that really affects the second and third pairings as well. So, you know, now all of a sudden you're talking that affects, you know, 40 minutes out of 60. So, um, you know, these trades, you know, are significant. And, uh, um, you know, that's why I, I think, uh, um, you know, general managers are willing, willing to do them because, uh, um, you know, they can have a significant difference, uh, but only one team can win, obviously. Now we, we've seen a unique trend in uh, the major North American pro sports over the last almost over a year now it's been. And you, you go back to uh, St. Louis Blues winning the Stanley Cup. They'd never won the Cup before. Then we had the Toronto Raptors win the NBA Finals. They'd never won an NBA championship before. You go to the baseball season in the fall and the Washington Nationals win the World Series. Had never won the World Series before. Technically, the Super Bowl, Kansas City had won it before 50 years ago, but my argument is they'd never won it before as an NFL team. They were in the American Football League when they won in 1978. The last, they played the very last game in the history of the American Football League as a representative of them in that Super Bowl. So my argument is they, this is a first for them. They'd never won as an NFL team. So on that line of thinking, we're looking at some teams that are surprisingly – playing well this year that have never won the Stanley Cup. And right off the bat, you got to talk about the Vancouver Canucks. They may be the biggest surprise in the NHL right now, sitting atop the Pacific Division. Uh, that's your your home, Sasha. What's what's the attitude in Vancouver like? Do they think they're finally this could finally be their year? I, I don't think anyone's getting too far ahead of themselves at this point in time. The entire city is really just happy to be back in the playoff race, uh, sitting atop the top of the Pacific very much a surprise to anyone uh, who approached this season with a dose of reality. Um, and I think the majority of those reality-based people are still expecting this to be a very tough fight to even get into the playoffs at this point in time. Because when you look at the advanced um, metrics, um, you're talking about stats like Forsey, Fenwick, High Danger Chances, PDO, there's a regression coming for this team. Um, they're very sort of top heavy. They rely a lot on Pedersen and Besser and Miller to provide offense. Um, and they're getting really outstanding goal coming from Jacob Markstrom and to some extent that Uh And so you're talking about two goalies there who are basically outperforming what they've ever done um, in their shortish careers up to this point in time. And you're also talking about a defense core that's led, as you we were talking about before the show, by Brooklyn Schmidt Hughes, who is playing phenomenally and has an extremely bright future in the NHL. But over the long grind of an 82 game season, I think everyone's expecting uh, basically the teams play on the whole, and you can look at Hughes and Cooper Cousins, their plays to sort of come back to earth ever so slightly. And in a Western Conference that is going to be extremely tight on a Pacific Division that's even tighter, um, it's going to be a really fierce battle to win the division and even to get into the playoffs. Um, and from there, you know, making deep run is, is not something that anyone as I say, who is reality-based is, is thinking too much about it at this point in time. It's uh, the old mantra, you know, eight steps, one day at a time. Um, Kevin, you know, it's a different circumstance, obviously, but a couple of years ago we saw Vegas surprisingly sit atop the Pacific Division, a first-year expansion team, and get a chance to win the Cup, legitimate chance to win the Cup, when it was completely unexpected. Now, certainly Vancouver's not an expansion team, but they're a team – rebuilding. They're gone with a lot of young talent, They're good young talent. They've had three rookies in a row make it to the All-Star game. If you're Jim Benning, the Canucks GM, what do you do here? Do you just say, this isn't our year, stick with the future plan? Or is this a time to maybe say, you know, we got a shot at this and we should make a big move at the deadline? Well, first of all, he's he's already one of the big winners of this season. Like, you know, he's playing with house money at this point. Like, you know, basically... Uh, Vancouver fans are saying, eh, you know, Benning's got us going in the right direction. Like, you know, everybody's happy about the way the team looks. And, um, you know, and I, I think they're playing that way as well. Like the, when you watch them play, 
um, you know, they, they, they play as if the pressure's not on them. Like they're not a team that was expected to be here. So whatever they do, um, you know, especially if they're winning, uh, it's better than expected. And um, I, I think sometimes that can carry a long way. I think that that certainly helped uh, the Vegas uh, Golden Knights. Um, the, the only thing I would say is, like, it feels when you watch them, and, and you know, because, like, there's a rookie leading them on defense because they, they are relying on hot goaltending, and you like everything about them, but it's hard to feel like this is a playoff team. You know, you got to – you got to lose in the playoffs a little bit before you can figure out how to win. And, you know, they haven't been there. So even if they got in, it doesn't feel like they can make a, an extended run. Now saying that, um, you know, in recent uh, vintage, we've now seen surprising teams in the postseason with Vegas, with the Carolina hurricanes last season. So I think that's what everybody's kind of counting on in Vancouver is, Hey, look, you know, they weren't expected to be there. We're really happy with the direction, as you said, Benny, uh, as young players suddenly look really, really good. I mean, Quinn Hughes is playing like a veteran. Um, but, you know, what if we just got hot at the right time going into the playoffs? So, um, you know, nothing is certain, and the West is so wide open that who knows what's going to happen. But, um, you know, I wouldn't rule anything out. Like, they're not a team that I would bet on um, because, you know, you look at their Corsi, it's in the bottom third of the league. Um, like there are indications that they've been a little lucky, um, you know, and I don't want to take anything away from them because I, I've been impressed with them. I, I really have. Um, but, you know, it's not a team I feel comfortable. I, I like the, the Columbus Blue Jackets among the surprising teams just better. Although I will say that Columbus Blue Jackets are another team whose course is down near the bottom, you know, one third. And there's some, it feels like there's some luck involved there. But the one thing I say about the Blue Jackets is, you know, when I watch them play, they look hard to play against, you know, and that's what I want to see when you're going, you know, toward the playoffs is are you going to be hard to, to play against? And they've got a hot goalie and, and Merz Lickens. So, you know, I, I, I like them a little bit better than I like the Canucks, but I have been very impressed with how the Canucks have played this season. Yeah, if you put the Columbus Blue Jackets in the Western Conference, then that'd be a team that I'd be looking at. I just think the top of the East is so strong, but you're right. Um, Columbus is extremely hard to play against, and some of their sort of raw numbers don't look great either. But when you're talking about the quality of scoring chances that these two teams are giving up, Columbus is much better at limiting high game chances than the Canucks so, are. Well, very well. Yeah, I mean, the one thing about the Blue Jackets that I think is interesting is, you know, they have the sixth best record in the NHL. I think Vancouver is like 10. But here's what's remarkable. The five teams that are above the Columbus Blue Jackets have given up more goals than the Blue Jackets have. Like, who would have thought that, uh, you know, this season, given who they lost and, you know, Bobrovsky leaving through free agency, that suddenly, you know, they were going to be a team that would be hard to score against. Um, uh, like, they've really been remarkable. I think it's a case for um, John Tortorella to be coach of the year and, you know, maybe for uh, uh, Kekalainen to be GM of the year. Um, uh, both of them have done a remarkable job uh, keeping this uh, team competitive. And, um, I, I, you know, before the season, rarely do we have a guy who's come over, particularly when he comes over from Europe. Like how many times have there been, you know, the top scorer in Finland and everybody's exciting to see what he could do. And it just never quite pans out. You know, the translation between being a quality player in Europe and a quality player in the NHL, even the KHL, which is a, you know, a little bit higher league, uh, um, you know, some people compare it to the AHL. You know, that doesn't always, you know, translate as well. I mean, Gusev is a, is a good example of that, of how dominant he was. And there have been other players as well. Well, Merz Lickens is a guy that everybody said, oh, boy, you know, he was the best goalie not in the NHL, and he's going to come in. Well, he starts out slowly. But I tell you what, from what we've seen in the last month, like he has been every bit as good as advertised. You know, I think he's 11 and two with their goals against average in the 1.6 range and uh, save percentage over 950 over his last uh, 13 games. Since Corpusallo has gone down, he's given them better goaltending than Corpusallo get him, and I was impressed with Corpusallo. So uh, that's been part of it as well. They're they're a team that. Even though I don't like their Corsi and I, uh, I, I do like how hard you play against. There, there's a t team that I might just, you know, drop a shilling on, uh, just because I, I just think they're kind of a fun team, and I think the style they play 
is a playoff style. And that, you know, you raise an interesting point there with uh, Corpus Allo and uh, Merge Lickens. You know, you've got kind of two hockey traditions colliding there. You know, the old, the old theory, you don't lose your job because you get injured. But the other theory is you go with the hot goalie. So when Corpus Allo is healthy, does he have to wait to get his job back? <laughs> yeah, that's why they pay Torrell a lot of money. I, Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I'd keep Merge Lickens in there, but, you know, it's easy for me to say. Well, the part about the sort of modern NHL is you need two goalies, and they have two great ones. So I think that they could satisfy both of them um, down the stretch here by basically splitting time. Well, another event I want to talk about that's uh, getting interesting, the Calder Trophy race. There were odds out this week on uh, the Calder Trophy favorites, and uh, there was only three players listed in the odds, which is a bit surprising too, but the biggest surprise maybe is that the one, two are defensemen now going into the season. We all heard it was going to be a two man race and one of them was going to be named Hughes, but that was supposed to be Jack Hughes against Capo Caco. Instead, we've got Jack's older brother, Quinn Hughes and Colorado's Kale McCarr, who are the favorites. McCarr is still holding the, the better odds at minus 100, but right nearby you've got Quinn Hughes at plus 160 and then you drop all the way I believe it's plus 1300 for Victor Olofsson of the Sabres the only forward in the group now we the rookie's an interesting debate is you know it's not like the most valuable player is this a case where you're just picking the best the most talented rookie of the year or are you factoring in how valuable that rookie is to his team Kevin yes is the answer uh, all the above um, the one thing I don't like, uh, and I've, when I was president of the writers, I used to tell writers this, I don't like um, writers who discount players' performances based on age because the rules are clear. The, the rules are that, you know, players 25 and under are eligible and that, you know, you, there's nothing in the rules to say because a player is older that he should be penalized. So I, I never like that. You know, if you're eligible – for the award, then you should be treated fairly in that regard. But I do understand that um, in determining who's the best rookie, you got to determine a lot of factors, and a lot of those decisions that are made are subjective. And you know, one of the things I've always looked at is impact on the team. And you know, I'm a Kale McCarr guy. I in the preseason I picked him uh, to be in the top two. I thought he had an excellent chance to win because I thought he was a perfect fit for the Colorado Avalanche. I thought he was born to play with Nathan McKinnon. Moving up and down the ice uh, with McKinnon, I remember talking to him in the preseason, and I asked him what that's like, and he said, I'm just trying to keep up with him, you know, because, you know, the way he plays. But, you know, he can keep up with him. That's what I like about my car, and he can make plays at a high level. And I, I was very impressed with him and I, the last season, and I just thought, boy, this is a kid that's really going to make an impact. What I hadn't counted on is the impact that Quinn Hughes was going to have. I, you know, I know he's a talented player, but I didn't think he was ready. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, and so now what I'm struggling with a little bit is, is that I, I feel that, uh, um, you know, Quinn Hughes probably is more crucial to the Canucks success than Makar is to Colorado. Now, it's not Makar's fault that they got more weapons in Colorado. So, you know, I got to factor that in as well. But I, I, I really think Quinn Hughes' uh, ability to step in and play like a veteran, uh, and he makes mistakes, uh, don't get me wrong, but I'm de- he, he has been played well above his age uh, this season. And I think that's one of the reasons why Vancouver's having a lot of success. And I think I give him a little extra credit for that. So there's still some other rookies who did make the, the odds board that are having pretty good years. And- Kubalik in Chicago has 21 goals, which I believe leads all rookies. Uh, are you surprised that the numbers were so short that they were already narrowing it down to three, Sasha? Yeah, I was very surprised. Um, well, actually, I shouldn't say it was all that surprised because uh, one thing that you have to know when you get into the world of sports betting, in particular futures, is that books will look to get an edge wherever they can. And so there's no risk to them in narrowing the market to three players. Um, if someone else wins, all the better for them. So it's something that you absolutely have to be aware of when you're looking at futures like this. Don't just take the players that they've listed 
don't take the fact that they're the only ones listed as a foregone conclusion that they're the only ones who have a chance of winning the award. Um, and if you pull up uh, that online right now, you'll see that Dominic Kubalik has been added to the list, likely because someone wrote in and said, hey, I'd like to take a wager on Dominic Kubalik to win a rookie of the year. What would his odds be? Um, and they've gone ahead and listed him so that they can take more money on that frog. Um, so they've opened him up at plus 2,000. Um, just updating the odds that you were talking about before. Kale McCarr is a minus 150 favorite. Quinn Hughes is also at uh, shorter than even money at minus 110. And then you have Kubalik at plus 2,000 and Olufsen at plus 3,300. So you're looking at a pretty huge over round with two players who are already shorter than even money. Um, so that's an implied probability for both of them that goes well beyond 100%. Um, so there's not a, valid, a lot of value in that market right now. Uh, um, and I'm basically with you. This is, you're at too early a stage and too much of the season left um, to say that the market should even be limited to four players right now. Uh, I absolutely agree that the car and Hughes are the top two favorites and should be at the top of the board. Um, you're talking about two players who, although being defensive in the lead, all work in scoring. Hughes recently took over the lead from the car because the car was injured. Um, if I was, if I had to make a pick, I'll as I said, I don't want to bet on these odds right now, given what the odds are and given what the over round is. Um, but if I had to make a pick about who's going to win, I, should, I do still think it's going to be McCarr. He's been a more productive player when he's been on the ice. Um, and unless he gets injured uh, at some point in this uh, last part of the season here, I do think he will finish ahead of you in points. Um, and while he's not playing the same sort of matchup minutes, I don't think that that's going to matter quite as much. I think he's still a slightly bigger name playing in a bigger market. And so I would pick him. I've always argued, and I think most hockey people agree with the argument, that the hardest position for a young player to play on the ice is defense. You know, goaltending is obviously the toughest job in hockey, but I think a goalie, whether they're in the AHL or the OHL or the NHL, the job they're asked to do is pretty much the same thing. Whereas with a defenseman, he might be an, an offensive point producer and junior, but he comes up to the NHL and they don't want him playing that high risk game. They want him to take care of his own end. So that can impact his ability to produce. And, you know, there's an old theory that it takes anywhere from 200 to 400 games for a defenseman to really find his legs in the NHL. But yet here we are with two rookies dominating. And it surprised me. I decided to look back and see when was the last time the top two finishers in the Calder voting were both defensemen. There's only been three defensemen win the award in the last 21 years. But you've got to go back to 1966-67, the last year the Leafs won the Cup, the last year there were six teams in the NHL. Bobby Orr of Boston won the Rookie of the Year award, and Chicago Blackhawks defenseman Ed Van Imp finished second, and yet they let him go in the expansion draft to the Philadelphia Flyers. So, you know, uh, why is it so tough for defensemen to kind of make an early mark, Kevin? Well, I, I just think it's the – um, you know, all the hype that surrounds goal scoring. Um, uh, I, I think that's hard to overcome. Like, you know, sometimes, uh, um, uh, especially if a, if a defenseman is not a, a top scorer, um, you know, he can't make the offensive splash. You Like you remember, it's memorable when a guy scores 25 goals. But, you know, if you're a defenseman and you have a great season and you get eight goals and 37 assists, like, you know, that's a heck of a season for a rookie defenseman. But, you know, it just doesn't register um, in the, on the psyche the way that a 25-goal uh, season does. But saying that, I mean, you know, uh, writers are far more sophisticated than they ever get credit for. I mean, Barrett Jackman won one year, and he was essentially a stay-at-home defenseman. Uh, he was a defensive-minded guy. I think he beat uh, – didn't he beat Zetterberg uh, that yeah. year? Zetterberg yeah. 44 points that year, but – it's basically what it takes for a defenseman to win the awards for there to be no elite scoring forwards. Right. But Jackman was more, he had a lot of penalty minutes that year too, as I recall. Um, but, uh, you know, he, and he was known for his physical play, but, you know, he, he stood out as a defensive player um, and it, he was memorable. But I think that's why I just think it's sort of the, the uh, notoriety factor that uh, scoring, uh, you know, brings about that the defenseman just can't register. Do you think there's any factor weighing into the, the voting that a guy from Vancouver won it last year, Kevin, so you don't give it to a guy from the same team two years in a row? Well, I hope not, uh, and there shouldn't be, and I would think not, but, you know, who knows how 
people think. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the voting is hard to explain. Uh, you know, again, when I go back to when I was president of the writers, you know, I really wanted to increase the number of voters because, you know, when we only had uh, less than 60 ballots cast, you know, one bad uh, ballot, and by bad, I mean uh, some uh, choices that were hard to defend, um, that that spoiled the, the um, you know, the selection process, in my opinion, where if you have, you know, like, uh, you know, even though he got a lot of notoriety, like in the baseball balloting when Jeter was, was left off one ballot, um, you know, it doesn't really affect the outcome. But in that case, of course, there was a lot of notoriety because he was the only one. But uh, because there's more than 400 people were voting. And that's why I increased it now in the NHL. Uh, there's well over 100 people that vote, which, uh, um, you know, makes it so if, if one person doesn't vote uh, in, in such a way that it can be defended, at least it doesn't affect the outcome. It seems to me, Sasha, that of all the awards in hockey, the one that's the biggest crapshoot is the Calder. I mean, last year we we're going into the season, everybody thought a defenseman was going to win the award in Rasmus Dahlin, and it turns out to be Elias Pettersson. So if you're looking to met an early season future book, I would think if you want to take a flyer, the Calder's got to be one of your uh, best options to take a long shot. Yeah, it is. The problem there is that it's just so hard to handicap. Um, one of the reasons it's such a crap is because no one really knows what's going to happen. It's incredibly tough to predict how rookies, however seasoned or however skilled, are going to translate in their first season in the pros. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's without doubt the toughest NHL award to predict in the preseason. Um, I've never personally placed a preseason futures bet on the Calder Trophy, and I don't see myself doing so in the near future. Well, gentlemen, I'm looking at the clock on the wall, and it appears once again we've used up our allotted time. Another wonderful discussion on uh, the NHL and betting on the NHL. As always, I've been joined by Sasha Peruk and uh, Kevin Allen. Uh, we'll be back again next Thursday. And, uh, guys, thanks for being here, and I hope you'll all join us again next week. Thanks, guys.